Hi, my name's Annette Markham, and I'm a professor of digital ethnography at RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia. I'm also an affiliate professor in the Digital Living Program in Information Studies and Digital Design at Aarhus University in Denmark. Thank you for inviting me today. I'm delighted to be here to talk about my own area of expertise, which is creative, innovative, and ethical methods for studying digitally saturated social contexts. I say that rather than digital culture or digital media, because what I'm interested in doing is looking at either people who use digital technologies in their everyday lives, which is one form of digital ethnography, um, or people who spend a lot of time online in digital spaces uh, as a primary or secondary place where they can be with others. So those two sort of lines of research have connected for me for the past 25 years or so. In today's talk, I want to talk about uh, two different things and hopefully tie them together by the end. In the first part, uh, I want to talk about some of the characteristics of digital contexts that we've seen and noticed and studied since the early 1990s. So I'm going to show you some graphic images of the intersections of um, different frameworks or metaphors we might be using to study whatever we call the digital, which influences a lot how we think about online tools and what the unit of analysis is for researchers. And I'm coming at that from the perspective of a qualitative researcher who uses um, mixed methods in addition to ethnography as a mindset. In the second part, then, I will want to talk a little bit more about techniques and tools and ways of thinking that can enable us, you, to shift from primarily face-to-face -face contexts to digital contexts, particularly now during a pandemic. And by the end, I hope you'll recognize that this is, for me, as a methodologist and a longtime practitioner of methods of different kinds, this is more a matter of a mindset than any kind of adherence to a specific set of tools, or a tool specifically. Hmm. So let's get started. Part one characteristics of digital contexts from the 1990s till today. I find this to be a very important part of my own practice to think about how our metaphors for thinking about the internet and about digital communication have changed over the years and then what are some of the persistent characteristics that continue to influence and impact everyday life and also um, the building blocks or the social structures that comprise culture. In, s in an article that I will link for you at the end of the talk, I have outlined various waves of history, and I find this to be somewhat useful for others, but it's mostly uh, uh, useful for me in that I have a very strong sense of the early days when we studied life online as opposed to life IRL or in real life because the internet seemed so different from where we were physically located and precisely because bodies were absent and we were interacting only through black and white ASCII text in most cases to build relationships and communities, the body became very interesting and important for researchers to study. Then we 
you can see shifts throughout time and these are you know um, different waves of of inquiry we focused for many years on web 2.0 technologies which um, like blogs or um, uh, content production like YouTube uh, became ways that we could share with each other um, and as the internet became more mobile through mobile devices and as the technologies became more ubiquitous then the internet became something that was always on and we become very saturated in these digital technologies so as life gets closer and closer to being always in cyberspace cyberspace sort of loses its interest as a metaphor and we start thinking about other things like the fact that we are heavily networked and that information spreads in particularly interesting ways which became quite interesting during the in, in during 2011 when we saw the japanese earthquake and we saw um the Egyptian revolution create a, a sort of focus on viral media and content production by amateurs and changes in journalism and how news is produced and consumed. And how that happened over Twitter and Facebook started to make us think a lot about um, the platformization of technologies. This isn't the beginning of that era, but certainly a wave that we notice is this focus on apps and platforms. At the same time, in the early 2010s, around 2012, we um, see a rise in the focus on big data and big data analytics, also partly sponsored by the way that we were visualizing data because of large-scale events like the Egyptian revolution. The rise of big data then has the accompanying data analytics, which then become predictive because of algorithms. So a focus on quantification and datafication became interesting for um, researchers. And now we see since circa 2014, when Edward Snowden revealed how much the NSA in the United States was tracking people's personal data. A, a strong shift in research and methodologies that look toward um, power and politics and um, building critiques of algorithmic or analytic or AI structures. We also see a shift toward thinking about the autonomy and the um, independence of some of the algorithmic and uh, machine learning technologies. So there's an interesting shift, of not just in this arena, but many other arenas um, on more than human entities and agents uh, in our everyday lives. Another way to visualize this might be to use um, instead a series of Venn diagrams. I don't mean to confuse the this history but I do want to just mention that um, you can map out these distinctions over time and if I simplify this a bit this is where I think it, it connects to techniques for studying digital phenomenon in the early days we thought of the internet as a place digital culture really meant culture in digital environments but then the internet became kind of an information superhighway and speed of transmission of information and the enhancement of commerce became um, uh, a focus and the, and, and the changing of how we get and create news. Then we have a lot of converging technologies that, that really emphasize this point that computer mediated interactions through platforms and apps change almost everything about our lives and cultural formations. And we can also see um, a shift toward data analytics that sort of says data changes everything. The quantification changes everything. 
And then we have the idea that anything we study as social life is really an entanglement of many human and non-human entities, and the latter are becoming more and more intelligent. And as digital tech is everywhere and involving a lot more corporate ownership, which operate in many ways like black boxes, we have now shifted radically and, and importantly toward building strong critiques and ethical future models for what technologically mediated culture should look like. So this gives you a sense of where I am situating the fields that you may be entering when you adopt methodologies for shifting online to study social life. Now, I'm gonna switch gears radically and um, talk a little bit about techniques for studying digital phenomena as part two, and then bring these two pieces together at the end. The need to go online is quite real, and there are some things to be aware of as you enter this domain, um, but often I will come back when talking about such things to the core idea that methods are um, nothing really more or less than a series of choices that you make at critical junctures when you walk down some sort of analytical path or you make a decision about what question to ask and what question not to ask, when you decide to interview these people or not those people, when you decide to interview or observe at these times or in that platform and not in other platforms, what you're doing is hitting critical junctures where you make a choice and then your choice will lead you down a different path. It doesn't mean that the alternate paths are completely gone. It's, it is, though, the case that because we're moving on, those alternate possibilities are grayed out, obscured. And in the end, you end up where you are. This is, this is a graphic that I love to use because it's very simple and it helps us see that methods are more or less choices at critical turning points of a study, and that these um, are methodological choices that, that determine the next method you will need to use to move to that arena or that next path, but they're also ethical choices with consequences for both the participants and the people and the phenomenon that you study, and uh, but the, also the knowledge that future researchers have about that particular phenomenon. So there are broad consequences as well as microscopic community consequences for these kind of critical junctures and the paths that we take. That's not to scare you off, but it is to say that um, when we think about some of the techniques we might use to study digital phenomenon, um, it, the, the core thing to remember is that um, if you can be flexibly adaptive and ethically mindful and in a state of readiness, then you will be able to adopt any technique you need or the tools that will be the most useful depending on where you end up. So there's not one single way to do digital ethnography. There's not one single way to do online interviewing. There's no reason necessarily why one should do online interviewing versus other kinds of engagement, enactment, or elicitation of information from potential participants. So it's good to sort of have in your mind that, it's, that flexible adaptivity is a really important um, concern. Having said that, I will say that there are certain characteristics of digital culture that become important to think about. And by digital culture here, I just mean using digital media. That any time you, in, that you um, engage with a person or in an online context, you have to understand that they are also entangled in many networks and that there are many cultural contexts overlapping at the same time. The, the kinds of uh, studies that in the mid-2000s might have focused on um, single platforms, like, I'm going to do a study of Facebook, or I'm going to do a study of Snapchat. Uh, 
um, are a bit mythical if you want to understand um, something besides the platform because um, platform use is never singular it's always um, across many platforms and likewise um, because technologies are getting more and more embedded and embodied and they are everywhere focusing too much on the the medium will lose focus on on behaviors and um, characteristics of the people that we might want to study or the social contexts in which they are existing but at the same time because the because technologies are everywhere embodied and embedded they're also invisible which means it's more difficult to remember that the affordances of the technology have a huge impact on how people interact with each other and the that the affordances of say for example Twitter will heavily constrain certain kinds of utterances and interactions and enable other types. So it's important to understand that the, the technologies as they become more invisible make them um, more important to seek out at these invisible levels. Um, some of the persistent characteristics that we've seen of internet, internet interactions over the last 30 years is that um, people are able to, through the use of digital technologies, separate physicality from sociality. Um, so during a pandemic, when we say that we're social distancing, we should more accurately be saying we are physically distancing because that's certainly not the same as being socially distant. And this characteristic of being with others through digital means has been studied since the early 90s. And what we found back then was that people treat time as a sort of malleable construct. Um, you're able to start and stop time in, a, in effect when you don't click on a message to open it and wait until a better time to do so. Or, on the other hand, repeatedly open a message over and over again to relive the moment, to go back in time. Um, so time, and those are just two of many kinds of examples, time becomes um, not dispersed or not necessarily stopped or stretched out, but more malleable in many different ways. And people will have different experiences of time at different moments and in different contexts with different people. So it's not a universally understood cons context construct. Um, likewise, physical boundaries or physicality or the understanding of social presence is also something that is determined by the characteristics of the context and then maybe the situation. So it's not something that can be universalized. Um, because people have different and very unique experiences of place and a sense of presence, or in many cases, a sense of absence. Um, and then finally, it's important to remember that because of these entangled and global networks, cultural boundaries, uh, or whatever we might have once wanted to think about as boundaries of the field, become quite a lot more ad hoc or temporal rather than geographic. This can actually be quite useful when um, trying to decide where to locate your study because it's, it's useful to note that it's not actually locatable and that gives you more freedom to locate it. It also gives you more responsibility to know how you're locating it. So you have to really reflect carefully on, on what, what kinds of field boundaries you are constructing as you move through the field. It can often be difficult to identify what is the unit of analysis or the object of analysis because um, a lot of what might be relevant as a unit of analysis is actually invisible to you as a researcher. That can be complicated um, if what 
you're looking for is in how somebody backspaces or how they uh, don't contribute to a conversation rather than looking at what they do contribute to a conversation. And some of these things would be um, visible to you if if you were embedded in and an integral part of a community for a long period of time. You would naturally understand these tacit rules and routines, but because the these can be if you don't pay attention to them and in a context over time it can be very difficult to see some of these invisible um, but highly relevant modes of interaction and important connections and relations in fact data analytics can work against the qualitative researcher in this way um, in that it focuses only on the presence of connection that's been traced and therefore is available to be scraped and put into a data analytic model. So all of the things that are not included in that or hidden or obscured or not collected become sort of left out of the picture. The other reason that the unit of analysis can be difficult to identify is that the there's sometimes so many multiple um, interactions occurring simultaneously that um, it, it, it is a confluence of, m of many, many uh, networks and interactions and relations rather than s um, a conversation or um, a single interaction. So, for example, if you're interviewing someone about uh, their interactions, they may actually not even realize the extent to which their own interactions are really extensively entangled and that many contexts overlap at once. Um, and so their perception might give you a more clear sense than what is actually the case. And um, then finally, it's often difficult to identify a unit of analysis because uh, many of the agents that are operating to uh, filter or, um, let's just say filter in the case of, say, for example, Facebook feeds or what appears on Instagram are autonomous, um, invisible data agents that are operating in ways that we can't see and don't control. So the, the way that um, information appears to people and the kinds of interactions and relations that are available become quite problematic because of these um, other kinds of agents operating. So uh, the, the 21st century then would be in my um, conceptualization characterized by flow versus objects and um, that means that meaning occurs across platforms and that it's very difficult to conceptualize a, a whole and therefore understanding a holistic or getting a holistic sense is not just elusive or um, impossible it's actually probably not the most accurate way of thinking about cultural formations in this time period. I want to give a very brief example. Actually, it's not brief, but I'm going to make it brief. But I want to talk about some of the, the ways that this complicates my own study of anything. So let's take, for example, the Japanese earthquakes that occurred in early 2011. My question at the time was, how were people making sense of this event through social media and particularly through social media visuals. Because what I was seeing was a swarm of images and um, bizarre confluences of, of ways of making sense of this event as it was ongoing. 
I was paying most of my attention to face and Twitter at the time and this is sort of um, oh this is an example of something that I might get on my screen at any one time this is not uncommon for any of us we see Russia Times on the upper left showing a video that has um, kanji over the top, we see a uh, Twitter visualization on the bottom left of tweets and replies in the hour following the earthquake. We see a, a stream of tweets being live recorded, um, and then, interestingly, uh, the piano soundtrack over the top. And then we see lots and lots of visualizations about how the science behind this earthquake happened and what's happening in, because of it. So there's multiple interfaces and collaborative production of information. There's lots of sounds and images mixed with text. There's lots of mixes of personal and official sources. And there are uh, just this massive flood of information of all kinds. Where should I go? What should I study? Well, um, could I go to, like, you know, Google search to look at how people were conveying pray for Japan images? Should I follow that meme where it leads me? Or should I look more at the remnants of of loss and the destruction of everyday objects and the sadness around the image sharing. Here's an image of my Facebook page where a young boy, age 12 or so, has sent a clip called Japan to his mother. It was forwarded from another friend who had just posted it on his Facebook timeline. And the timing was interesting because it was during a moment when there was just this huge outpouring of images and videos about all things Jap Japanese prompted by the earthquake and then the subsequent international attention. Um, this is the only Japan-related meme that got mentioned by this boy since the earthquake. And it was then posted and shared by his mother who had also never before posted any Japanese-related information. So if I wanted to focus in on this particular um, way of making sense, would I look at this Facebook feed on my page, or would I go to their pages to look at where the video was originally posted? Or would I separate the video as an artifact from the context in which it was actually experienced so I could just listen to it here and now you are experiencing it and I don't know if any of you will recognize the language being spoken but it's worth noting that it's not actually Japanese seen alone the video is quite interesting but then if you look at it in its context and this is a screenshot from a few weeks later it has you know like it now has a an, a level of contextuality that wouldn't be seen otherwise so you can see all these suggested videos on the right and I will tell you if you were to find this video now these would all change and then perhaps the number of views would change and the the maybe the content here would have also changed maybe then also the um, title would have changed since it's not actually an example from Japan. It swiftly, as a unit of analysis, becomes more and more layered and complicated when we start to understand it in its information flow. So it's an interesting dynamic. Um, and maybe Maybe the whole search is reminding me that my question is, mm, it's not very good yet. How are people making sense of the Japanese earthquake visually through their social media? But still, my immediate challenges are, are quite concrete. Do I need to look both online and offline to get a, an accurate sense of what's going on here? How do I draw boundaries around 
a field. What would be the field here? What should I collect? Everything? And what would I do with it? How could I sort and manage or grapple with that mountain of data that would result? Should I get participants? How many would be enough? How much data would be too much? If I do get participants, how can I get informed consent? And then how do I protect privacy when everything um, that I might find on these feeds is public, but there might be perceived privacy and people might need to have more privacy in their, uh, in, uh, and of course they will need more privacy in, a, in an encounter with me alone in a formal or an informal conversation. And speaking of conversations, how should I interview? Should I interview? And finally, not finally, but to end this slide, how do I figure out when to end the project? These questions arise uh, and their challenges because the methods of qualitative inquiry um, were really born uh, as part of the larger anthropological project. So if you think about what drives our social inquiry, it's Malinowski or people like him, white Europeans, who would go to foreign locations and study the cultural dynamics of tribal peoples or people very unlike themselves. And um, so the guidance that would answer these questions it is continually in textbooks pointing us backward to this model for research when actually the social context that we are looking at look a lot more like this. And if you were to zoom in on any of these tiny dots, you would see another universe exploding behind it of vast additional networks of connection and um, dynamics and relations and important things to look at and think about. And this only grows as time passes, as the earthquake is made sense of by people and as phenomena carry on throughout the life course of people who might be affected by them or by such events. So instead of asking the questions in the way that I asked, I. I started in 2012 to ask the questions differently. Why should I observe? I asked in a negative or critical way. How could, I, how could you do participant observation of Twitter anyway? Why should I participate? What would that mean? What would really mean participation? Why do field notes? Why interview? Why get informants? Why gather artifacts? These are classic methods of anthropology that if we start to unpack them and go back to the core of ethnographic inquiry, um, we can start to, instead of taking them for granted as good practice, we can start to unpack why they were used in the first place and what information they would yield, which is the key point. What do they give us? What does observation do for us? What do I get when I participate that I would not otherwise get? What do you field notes produce and why is that meaningful? And in what way could I do something else that would produce the same kind of granularity and depth of description of what is in the scene that I see? What does an interview give me? And how might I get the same kind of richness of perception data that an interview would provide without doing an interview? Why would I need to get an informant? What was an informant used for in a classic anthropology situation? What would give me that same informant knowledge? Is it me? Should I be my own informant? In that case, should I interview myself? How would I interview myself? Would I, so do you see how the, if we go back to question the, the tools and go back to the premises behind the tools, we can start to uh, 
be productive in rethinking and reimagining what is possible. Shifting slightly, um, another way to um, rethink this kind of classic being situated in the field is to follow what um, George Marcus might call multi-sided or multi-sided ethnography. And in this, I think his, one of his key points for me is this idea of following that you can follow whatever makes sense because if an ethnography is inherently and always in the postmodern era, multi-sided, and if we are in entangled networks, then we can follow a thing or follow a metaphor or follow a story, a thread, a person, an impulse. And by doing so, then um, we need to think about what does it mean to be in an orientation that is less about objects that we are observing or individuals in stable societies and more about moving through digital flows. I've written about moving through digital flows in this um, piece in the Qualitative Data Collection Handbook. And in this, my colleague Anna Katrina Gamelbu and I argue that um, flow is not just what we study, but flow is what the researcher does. So those are two very important and distinctive, but very related kinds of notions that it is that we're studying flows and that we're also flowing. So what does that imply for practice? Um, well, it, let me add another complication that when we're flowing through uh, information networks and studying anything on in digital platforms like say for instance Facebook or um, Twitter or even email, if we're looking at um, what is in this context that we supposedly have identified, we need to recognize that everything that is there is not all there is. And what is there is not all there was. And what is there is both going to be too much because it's overwhelming and it will create mountains of data. And yet it will never be enough because it doesn't give us meaning, it only gives us traces of presence or statements or people's understanding of their own perception. So meaning doesn't come from the data. Therefore, um, it, a straightforward project might be to think about just phrasing provisional research questions that enable you to go through a door and then start exploring broadly. Just follow whatever, right? Go with the flow. Embrace then the fact that all of your methods are decisions at critical junctures and that you will selectively and subjectively go down one path and ignore other possibilities. So embrace that subjective selectivity and immerse yourself as much as you can and as for long as you can. Then at some point you want to um, externalize your more empirical impressions and experiences by uh, drawing them, mapping them, somehow getting them out of your brain and onto the page. And in, an, in a culture that is fragmented and networked, it often becomes uh, useful to map it in kind of concept map, visual oriented kinds of ways, rather than just trying to write about it. Because the linearity of writing does not really in, um, it match well with the kind of networkiness of culture and the way that information spreads and entangles and overlaps. Then repeat. Um, so, for example, I might look at the Japanese video and then kind of map all the things that were around it in the YouTube 
page. It doesn't really help me much. I mean, in some in some way, it might matter, uh, and 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 then I could follow, you know, follow one of these paths to look at how information is transmitted. But it's not very interesting to me. So one of the interesting things is that I can. Um, I can sort of say, yes, this map is telling me where this idea might lead, the Japan video, where this idea leads, rather than what the Japanese earthquake is about or what this video is about. Right? So, so it can provide me with a different sensibility. Mm. And, and then I could set that map aside. And then instead, I could say, well, let me follow kind of a, a a viral or a spreading or information dissemination model like what is the when does the event happen and how does that and where does it go like through i mean in one case it goes through youtube and then facebook posts but maybe this all these things that it, all these different um, material sources that give me information are being spread through vast networks and then eventually and this is a very complicated thing that i've simplified as three radar lines moving out eventually these kind of memes start to emerge around geography or the history of japan or around norms and practices of japan or around religion in japan or the fact that there are auto manufacturing layoffs in the usa because of the japanese earthquake or and, and if I just follow one, like let's say cultural capital of Japanese art forms, I could sort of start to remap again. Like, oh, well, that's interesting. There's so much focus on Japanese art forms during this immediate period following the earthquakes. Then I start to recognize there's a strong connection somehow between American pop culture and Japanese pop culture through anime. And then I might say, oh, let me follow the history of anime or let me analyze some popular memes around anime or let me talk with some meme creators or content producers, right? You can sort of see that this is not at all narrowing the focus of analysis or helping me get the project done. But what it is helping me do is explore what exactly am I interested in? Let's say I follow that Pray for Japan images that I showed you a while back. And let's say that I, you know, decide I want to go down that route instead. And I, I might then get an or see or run across an E invite to a prayer circle, which is a really bizarre sense of thinking about religion and why we pray for Japan. And, and then, and then um, I might say, well, maybe I'll chat with the sender of this prayer circle invitation, and then maybe I'll use that as a snowball sample to talk to different people. And maybe the study won't be about Japan at all. Maybe it'll turn into a study of religion and how religious memes um, reinforce or invite people to uh, uh, explore new, new ways of thinking um, and new religions. I don't know. I mean, you can sort of see the the process of me spiraling around and around this topic and I keep hitting, you know, different themes or revisiting um, themes at different levels and I and I'm revisiting the question as well, like what am what is it that I'm really studying? And this shouldn't be simple because it's not a predetermined study. So qualitative research um, is characterized by uh, inductive, cyclical, and ideally um, emergent methods um, and processes of sense making. So, returning to the concepts of you know sort of digital ethnography or ethnography in general, you know we can sort of return to 1973 and and. Clifford Geertz in his understanding of culture as uh, webs of significance, as he says, believing that man is an animal suspended in webs of significance he himself has spun, I take culture to be those webs and the analysis of it, therefore not to be an experimental science in search of law, but an interpretive one in search of meaning. <laughs>
And then in thinking about how you might grapple with what is the unit of analysis and the topic of research in a, in these sort of times of um, digital connection and uh, entanglements, I, I guess I would say let's go back to you know classical Sherlock Holmes ideas about being flexibly adaptive. I mean, Sherlock Holmes may be called the consummate deductive detective, but he certainly is not always deductive. He's not always deducing. He's very iterative and inductive. He uses multiple methods. He's quite forensic in that he's driven by science and, and evidence. He's curious, but he's also open to change. Um, and these are important characteristics when, when we're doing qualitative research. So to summarize, classical fieldwork methods mostly don't fit with networked cultural contexts. And instead of asking, how should I do online ethnography, we might be better off asking, what will help me explore and really be open to understanding the complications of this phenomenon, whatever it might be? And that might mean deconstructing classic fieldwork techniques and then reconstructing them from the ground up to get more resonant results. The bottom line is that qualitative inquiry, digital ethnography or otherwise, draws strength from really inductive processes that are messy and emergent. And um, if you look at the kind of research that's been done over the last 30 years, it uh, changes radically as different uh, phenomena become more salient it's flexibly adaptive. And that requires having a large toolbox of multiple methods at one's disposal. If you don't have the training, then one way to think about it is to, um, to recognize uh, that, that you will um, be doing a lot of experimentation and that that's actually okay. That, so once you let go of the idea of some of the classic field work principles, or I should say um, concepts like boundaries of the field or interview or participant observation, then you can decide for yourself what makes most sense to um, get closer to the phenomenon. And then being creative and experimental um, becomes a, a way of being more free and opening up possibilities for um, innovative methods that really get toward something. Now, of course, this requires a lot of justification, but there's a long legacy of experimentation in the qualitative arena, and there's um, lots of different resources that you can use to build um, your practice. and. And in a way, um, if you think of research as being sort of dedicated to looking um, at a phenomenon rather than going to a place or studying a set of people, then um, you, can, you can return to the essential questions, the, and I mean by this the research questions, to sort of say, what would be a better question that I might ask that helps me get away from the idea that this has to be place-based or person-based. And so what is it that I'm really after? And sometimes that's not even evident until after you've done the research, that you might think you have an idea of what you want to study, but you don't, because the more you know, the less you know. The longer you situate yourself in a particular context or with um, an intense focus on a phenomenon, the more you will realize you had no idea what you were getting yourself into. So qualitative research is, is a process of continually, you know, sort of diving into this deep pool of endless possibilities 
and then making some choices that are tough you know that you have to sort of say this is great I could study this but maybe that will be for next year or 10 years from now and you have to carve out tiny little pieces that then become um, moments or situations or disjunctures or curiosities that you can dive into more closely for the purposes of doing a study. So, thank you very much for your time. These are some um, resources that I used in this talk, and you can always email me um, or find me on Twitter or look at my writing on AnnetteMarkham.com, and I'm happy to uh, chat with you about your research projects. <laughs>